Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's uh, webinar. My name is Mary Ann Zachariah and I'm the administrator for the informatics program here at the UCLA CTSI. Um, today we're going to be presenting the Los Angeles Data Resource or LADDER. It's a self-service cohort discovery tool that you can use to explore the size of potential patient populations at various healthcare institutions across the Los Angeles area. So the LADDER consortium is made up of UCLA, CEDARS, USC, CHLA, City of Hope, and uh, Charles Drew University and its affiliated community clinics. Karina Hamp is our lead trainer and she'll be presenting LADDER to you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and mute everyone now, so if you have any questions for Karina during her presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat window, but be sure to address them to me. Um, and again, my name is Marianne, uh, or to everyone, and I'll respond to them as they come up. Once Karina finishes her presentation, we'll go ahead and unmute everyone, and you can feel free to ask questions then as well. Um, okay, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, this is Karina, and like Marianne mentioned, today I'll be showing you how bladder can help you find the size of your study population. So bladder is a self-service online cohort discovery tool. Basically that means that you would go to your site's bladder website and then log into the application and you can use the tool by yourself. It is free and easy to use, and you don't need any IRB approval to use Ladder. So Ladder is useful for obtaining patient counts. Basically, you put in your study inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then as a result, you'll get the number of patients at the different Ladder sites. Um, also, you can use Ladder to help you choose other institutions to approach for participation if you do find that a larger sample size might be needed. So typically, investigators will use ladder for feasibility assessments. Um, an example could be if you're doing a recruitment study and you run a query in ladder and you find that your site might not have enough patients to recruit from. So maybe you want to reach out to some of the other sites um, to then join you in your study um, to get a larger sample size. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, um, maybe you're doing a chart review study at your site and you do a ladder query and you find that your site um, has a much too large uh, sample size available, so you can actually use ladder to maybe help you narrow down your selection criteria to make the population size a bit more manageable. Um, ladder counts have been used on industry-sponsored feasibility questionnaires. They're often used in grant proposals as well as IRB applications. So here are some real-world examples. Um, the screenshot on the left is an example from a UCLA IRB application. So here it is actually asking for the number of records available for the study. We can use Ladder to find that out. Um, the top right is a screenshot um, of an industry-sponsored feasibility questionnaire. And here it's also asking for some patient counts. And then the bottom right table is a screenshot from the NIH targeted enrollment table. And um, so if you're doing a recruitment study and you're planning to apply for an NIH grant, um, then you can use Ladder to fill out this uh, table as well. Um, so this slide gives you an idea of the data that's available in Ladder. Um, the sites that we currently have data or in ladder includes Cedar Sinai, City of Hope, UCLA, and USC, um, Children's Hospital LA, and community clinics affiliated with Charles Drew University um, will be loading their data into the system next. Um, so we're continuously uploading data into ladder. And then on the right side of this table, you can see all the variables available to search on. So in your selection criteria, you can use demographics. Um, diagnoses and procedures codes, lab tests, medications, some visit details, vital signs, and vital status. And then the bottom table shows you the amount of uh, data available in Ladder. And I do want to point out that um, City of Hope and USC currently have partial data available since they were the latest sites to add their data into the tool. Um, and I'll explain later on how this is 
um, important with respect to your query results. But all in all, there's over 9 million unique patients included in Ladder, and there are over 900 million observations um, available for you to search on. So now that you have an overview of Ladder, I'll go ahead and do a whole training for you guys so that you can see how you would be able to use Ladder to run your queries. Um, so this is just the UCLA Ladder login website. Um, your site will have their specific Ladder web page, and your site will reach out to you with the specific access information. Um, but generally, you do need to be affiliated with one of the Ladder sites. Um, and so because of that, you do need to be connected to your site network to be able to log into Ladder. So that means if you're off-site, then you would need to use APN access. And then once you log in, this is what the application looks like. So in the top right is your Navigate Terms and Find Terms section. This is where you'll find all of your selection criteria. The top right window is the query tool. So this is where you would be dragging and dropping your uh, selection criteria and building your query. The bottom right window is where the query results will come up after you run a query. And the bottom left window is where you will be able to see all of your previous queries. Um, so back up here into the Navigate Terms, um, again, you can see all the folders for the variables that we have available. So we have some demographics for diagnoses. There's ICD-9 and 10 codes. There's SODs, medications for procedures. There's CPT, ICD-9 and 10 codes. We have some visit details, uh, vital signs, and vital status. Um, so for my example today, um, let's say that I'm going to be going to be doing a study on diabetes patients, and so I'll go ahead and just drill down into the ICD-9 codes. Um, and I know that the ICD-9 code that I'm looking for is 250. So you can keep opening the folders. Um, you can drill all the way down into the very specific terms and drag those over, or you can also just drag over a folder. So then everything within that folder will be included. Um, and then instead of drilling down into the folders, you can also just go to find terms and then, for example, type in the ICD-9 code. And sometimes it's a little bit faster to find your criteria that way. And so now if I want to um, add some more criteria to this query, so for example, if I want to find patients with diabetes and they're Asian, um, so under demographics, I'll go into race, and then I would drag Asian into my second group. So anything in different groups will be an AND function, and then anything in the same group would be an OR function. So for example, if I drag Black or African American into the same group, now this is an OR function. So basically this query would be looking for patients with diabetes and they're Asian or Black or African American. Um, and later on, I will show you guys how you can make your queries more complicated and how you can modify your queries and add some restrictions. But for now, I'm just going to run this query so that you can see what the results will look like. So once you're ready, you just click on the Run Query button down here. This window pops up, so first you can change the name of your query if you would like. And then once you click OK, the query starts running. So then in the bottom right window, in the query status window, this shows you how long your query has been running for. Um, depending on how complicated your query is, some can take longer than others. Also, some sites just take longer than others. Um, one tip to make your queries run faster, though, is to put the more restrictive variables in the first group and then broader variables like demographics put in later groups, and that will help your query run a little bit faster. Um, however, if a query does ever take more than 180 seconds or three minutes, um, so if any site is you know, taking a bit longer, then um, the query does time out, and you will be able to see the results from the sites that have been able to return the results already. 
but then for any site that hasn't been able to return a result, they'll just say it's still processing request next to it. Um, so for example, like let's say today UCLA was just taking a much longer time. They took, you know, over 180 seconds. Um, so instead of seeing a number here, you would just see a still processing request. And so if that does happen, don't worry, the query is still running in the background. Um, so you can actually log out and log back in um, another day or a later time and then check on that query um, in your previous queries. And once the results are ready, um, you'll be able to see them here in your previous queries. Um, so you can see that the results are obfuscated by plus or minus three patients. We try to keep it as de-identified as possible. Um, they should be getting one number for each of the sites um, included in ladder. Um, also, if any site has 10 or fewer patients that match your uh, selection criteria, um, even if it's zero patients, it'll just say 10 patients or fewer. Again, we just try to keep it as de-identified as possible. Um, and then if you ever think that the um, numbers, the results look off to you, then my first recommendation would be to check the ladder.org website. This is the general ladder website. Um, go to data. And then there are some useful tables here. So the first table, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, City of Hope and USC has partial data available. So here you can actually see what data we have available for each site. And then since UCLA and Cedars were the first sites to um, add their data into Ladder, we have complete data for them. Um, so this might account for um, why some of like the City of Hope, for example, numbers might be lower. And then um, the second table actually is a bit more detailed and shows you the different, de different years available at each site and then um, as well as the across the different variables. So for example, um, like maybe you are looking for patients who had cancer in the last three years. You might expect to have hoped to have a much larger number, but then if you check this table, you can see that generally their observations are going to the end of 2016. Um, so both of these tables are good to reference. Um, however, if you still think that the numbers look off, then definitely contact your site's ladder representative, and we can look into uh, what might be going on. And then for any site that does have present data, um, they update their data about once a month. And so because the data is updated once a month, we ask that you don't run the exact same query several times in a week because the system will think that you are trying to find the exact number of patients and it might lock you out of your account. Um, just something to keep in mind. However, you shouldn't need to run the exact same query over and over again because you can um, you can actually print out your query result. So when you click this print query button, after you run a query, then you can just save a PDF of your results. Um, and then again, your previous queries will be saved here. So you can open these folders and view your previous results. Um, you can see that I do run the exact same query a lot, but since this is my training account, um, I don't get locked out. And also, um, if you ever want to modify any of your previous queries, you can do that and the system won't recognize that as running the exact same query. Um, so that's totally fine. Um, and then, so how you would do that, you would um, drag this uh, topmost folder, make sure you're, you're not dragging the results folder, um, drag the topmost folder back up into query name so it will repopulate all of the groups. Um, so like say if you're coming back another day, then instead of having to rebuild your whole query, you can just drag over previous query and then now you could modify it, add some restrictions, whatever you want to do. And so some ways that you can modify your queries. Um, you can add date restrictions, so each group has a dates button. Um, so for example, if we would like to find patients with diabetes in 2014, I can click on dates, and then I would just put in my date range here, so January 1st, 
2014 through December 31st, 2014. And so now that date restriction will be added to the first group. Um, you can also change, oh, um, there's actually two important things to remember about date restrictions. Um, so first, make sure that you're using the correct ICD codes. So generally, um, we switched from ICD-9 to 10 codes in 2015. Um, so just make sure you're using the right one. I usually recommend to just put both the ICD-9 and 10 code into the same group just to make sure you're capturing everybody. And then the second important thing to remember about date restrictions is that we can't actually date restrict on any of these demographics, and that's because our demographics are current. Um, we can't go back in time with these. That means with age, um, we can't go back in time with this age folder. However, if you do want to um, be able to date restrict on ages or go back in time, then there's this age app visit uh, criteria, and you can uh, date restrict on this. And I'll show you an example using this age app visit in a few minutes. Okay, and then now you can also change the occurrences. So for example, maybe I wanna find patients who are more established at their um, healthcare institution. So I just click on occurs. Um, and then so events within the group would occur more than three times, for example. So they would have this diabetes diagnosis come up more than three times. Um, there's also an exclude button. Um, so if you have any exclusionary criteria, you would just drag this into new group and then click exclude. Um, the exclude button is also really useful if you are doing a recruitment study and you would like to um, exclude deceased patients. So um, under vital, site, vital status, we have known deceased per EMR. Um, keep in mind that we don't have um, California Death Registry data available, so we would just know if the patient passed away in the hospital um, or if their medical records were somehow updated. Um, so it's not entirely accurate, but it's better than nothing. Um, so how you would use this, you would just drag deceased per EMR into a new group and then exclude. So now for your recruitment study, you can focus on the patients who are alive. And then um, you can also use exclude if you are trying to find patients who are currently adults. So under demographics and then age, instead of having to drag over all of these 18 and plus folders, you can just drag over the first two, so zero to nine and 10 to 17. And then just click exclude. Um, and now we'll be finding patients who are currently 18 and over. Um, just a little tip to make it a little faster. Um, okay, and you're not restricted to just three groups. There's a new group button down here. Um, you can't see the first groups, but there's an arrow where you can scroll. Um, additionally, some of the variables actually ask you to enter values. So for some lab tests um, for vital signs, if you drag these over, you can enter values, so automatically pop up this box. So for example, um, I dragged over BMI, and let's say we're looking for patients who are overweight, I can just select greater than 25. Um, and then if you want to find patients who just had that vital sign or that lab test taken, you can um, go ahead and click no value. Um, and then for any lab test that you would like to be able to restrict to certain values, but it doesn't ask you to enter a value, then you can put in a request at your site and we can add that functionality for you um, for that specific lab test. Um, also, if there's ever a lab test that does ask you to enter a value, but you find that you your site might be using different units or something, um, then again, you can put in a request and we can um, add those units that you're looking for. Um, okay, so now if you ever want to delete any of your criteria, you can just right click on the variable and select delete. Um, if you want to remove a whole group, um, each group has an X button, so you can just delete a group that way. And then if you want to start all over, you can just click on the clear button. Okay, so that was the most basic type of query that you can run in Ladder. There's actually three different types this drop down up here. Um, 
this shows you all the three different types available. So the one that we just did, um, the default type of query, is um, where you're treating all groups independently. The second type of query, you can actually select groups to occur in the same financial encounter. Um, so for our example, let's say we want to find overweight patients um, who were adults at the time of their diabetes diagnosis. So first of all, I'll load my, I'll load my query, I'll drag over the diabetes diagnosis. Um, they also need to be overweight, so I'll drag over BMI again, and then enter the value greater than 25. And then um, we also want them to be an adult during their diabetes diagnosis. So since we are going back in time with age, I will use this age at visit criteria, drag that into the third group, and here it will ask me to enter my values, so greater than or equal to 18 to find adults. And now the second and final step for this type of query is to make sure that each group's dropdown is um, set to the correct selection. So basically, any group that has a dropdown set to occurs in same encounter, that means that the variables in those groups all, ha all happen during the same visit. So right now we're basically saying that the diabetes diagnosis, um, their BMI value that was greater than 25, and, their, uh, and they were adults all during the same visit. Um, but so let's say, for example, that we don't care when they have this BMI value, I can just change this group to treat independently. So now the first group, the diabetes diagnosis, and the third group, the age, um, would be happening during the same visit while this BMI value happened basically um, during any visit. Okay, and that's how you run that type of query. Um, the third type of query is um, a temporal query, so you, action, you can actually define a sequence of events. So, for example, uh, going on with our example, um, let's say we want to find patients who were first overweight and then later on developed diabetes. Um, so I just go to define sequence of events. And there's a few extra steps with this type of query. Um, but the second, uh, the second drop down pops up and we click this, it'll show you the order of steps to take. So first you can define your population in which the events occur. So for example, if you're doing a study on females, you could drag that over in here, or you can just leave it blank to include everyone. Um, I'm just going to uh, leave it blank. And then next, we would go to event one. So here we're going to define our first event, which is um, the patient needs to be overweight first. So again, I'll just drag over BMI, select greater than 25. Um, and then you can make this as complicated as you want. I'm just keeping it simple. I'm just keeping it to one variable for my first event. And then next, I would go to event two. And so in our case, this is the diabetes diagnosis. Just drag this into my second event. And then the last step is to define your order of events. So here there's a bunch of different drop downs um, for different ways that you can define the order. So basically the default is just saying that the start of the first ever BMI value greater than 25 in our case occurs before the start of the first ever diabetes diagnosis. Um, there is also this checkbox that you can use if you want to do any time constraints. So for example, um, if we want the patient to have that BMI value before the diabetes diagnosis by more than one month, for example, you can change that here. Unfortunately, the AND checkbox is disabled for now because it was causing a bug, um, but hopefully it will be re-enabled soon. Um, and that's how you run your temporal query. So once you're done, again, you would just click on Run Query. Um, okay, so that's how you run queries in Ladder. Those are the three different types that you can do. Um, however, if you ever find that Ladder isn't able to run a more complicated type of query that you need, um, or if you're just not able to find the specific variables that you need in Ladder um, because 
Of course, we can't include absolutely everything from the medical records. Um, if that ever does happen, then I will show you in a second how you can put in a request for more specific counts. Um, however, let's say that you do run some queries on ladder, you get a good study population size, um, maybe used it on your grant proposal, obtained some funding, and now you're actually ready to obtain individual patient level data from the medical records. Um, so like for example, in our case, if we're doing, if we're using our diabetes, overweight diabetes cohort, um, let's say now that we actually want to know, you know, what the actual BMI values for each of the patients were, or um, at what dates they had their um, first diabetes diagnosis for each patient. Um, so once you're ready for that step, you can click on request more data here within the application. And this is also where you're going to request more specific counts. So when you click here, um, it'll ask you to fill out this form. So you would just specify if you want more counts information or if you want patient level data. Um, so you fill out the form with your information, some more specifics about your data request, and then you would select which sites you want the data from. Um, since each site has a different uh, data request process, um, if you have specific questions about how the process works, then I would suggest to reach out to your site's ladder representative for more information on that. Um, however, the common factor across the sites is that the data requests do take a bit of time, so just make sure that you're submitting your request um, a few months in advance. Um, okay, and if you are requesting data from other sites, you will most likely need to identify a collaborator at the other site. So if you need any help finding a collaborator um, back in the ladder application, you can click on the find a collaborator link. And again, this will be a form that you can fill out with your study information. And then um, you can check off which sites you would like a collaborator at, and then that site will do their best to help you identify a collaborator. Um, okay, so that completes the training for ladder. Um, let me go back to the presentation. Um, so again, your site should be reaching out to you for specific um, access information. However, if you don't hear for the, from them um, or if you have any specific questions in the future, then definitely feel free to reach out to us and email us. Um, if you do ever need a refresher on what I went over today, then our, um, we'll post a video of this webinar on ladder.org, so keep an eye out for that. Um, so now, with all that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone and give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, great. My name, hi, I have a question. I was looking, um, thank you for the presentation, that was very helpful. The, um, I was wondering if there's a way to see if someone has like a count of how many, like if, if I wanted to see if they have like of diabetes hypertension, heart failure, or whatever, several diagnoses to see if, if we could find a count for how many of total they have. Um, yes, so this is Krina. Um, so unfortunately in ladder, since you're just getting um, distinct patient counts from the tool, um, you wouldn't be able to get, you know, the number of diagnoses or something. Um, if you do want more specific information like that, um, like I mentioned before, um, if you go to the request for more data link on the ladder application, then um, you could specify that in that form, and then um, your site's programmers would run the query for you and get that more detailed information. So, like, for example, if I had 10 diagnoses and I said, can you return how many patients have three or more of these 10? That would be something that the, our own programmer locally would be able to help me with, you think? Um, so you, you could specify in your occurrences, the occurrences button, um, if you want the patients to have three or more of the uh, whatever diagnoses you're looking for. So if you're looking for multiple diagnoses, 
Um, you could drag them all over into one group, the support function, and then you would like, change the occurrences to three or more. Um, and then you'll be able to find the number of patients that match that that way. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So that, is that what you're trying to yeah, do? Yeah, I think so. So if you if you drag, let's say, 10 into the group one, like 10 diagnoses, and then you say occurs greater than three, then that would say how many have at least three of these 10. So for example, like I would drag these two, change the occurrence to more than three times, for example. Um, so it would find the number of patients who either um, have the diabetes diagnosis more than three times or this ovarian dysfunction diagnosis oh, okay. more than. And that would be a little different um, because it would be like how many of them have ever had a diagnosis of a whole bunch of them. Okay. So maybe maybe I would ask my programmer. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is regarding kind of doing like longitudinal data analysis. Um, and if you guys, obviously we want to protect um, patient information, but if, if those like ID numbers that are supplied for patient individual levels, um, if that's consistent throughout time. Um, I'm not sure what your question is. So I'm, I'm asking like ID how, numbers? how, yeah, like if a, a patient, if there's a patient ID attached is that number consistent each time you run a query? Oh, so are you talking about getting counts or the patient level data? The patient level data. Okay, so when you're requesting patient level data, um, generally um, you can request PHI. Um, when I was talking about keeping it as de-identified as possible, I mean like when you're actually running queries in the tool, so when you do want to request more data, you can request PHI, and of course you'd have to obtain the right approvals and everything. Um, so you would be able to keep track of the patients that way. And then additionally, if you do just want the identified um, data, then I believe typically the site would assign a unique patient study ID um, to your specific patients, and then we would be able to keep track of them that way as well. Is there a way to query if a patient has been seen, you know, several times throughout a year? Um, let's see. So, um, is this then going back to counts or the individual patient level data? I guess this would be sort of a query of like counts to see how many individuals, or like what the sample population would be of individuals that have, you know, been followed for several consecutive years for maybe a certain diagnosis. Um, I don't believe that you would be able to use the uh, ladder tool for that um, because like within the ladder tool, um, we can't like keep track of the individual patients that way. Um, but so that would be like a request that you would put into your site for more specific counts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There is the visit type. I don't. Can you can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just would say that it, w one thing that might help you would be if you want them to have more than a certain number of ambulatory visits within the last you know, three years, you could specify that. So um, so you, you could use the visit types potentially to to ensure that they had some minimum number of visits within some time interval. That might not be exactly what you were talking about. Uh, if you do want to get more, you know, more detailed than that, you probably would have to uh, work with uh, a programmer. Thanks, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Start to jump in there. Any other questions? Though? Yeah, could you please just explain the process about getting access again? Um, so each site will actually have a different process for getting access. Um, 
So depending on which site you're part of, um, that site should be emailing you after the webinar um, and giving you specific information about that. Okay, thanks. This we is do have to have oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say you do have to have an account, uh, and, and those are handed out by the sites, as Karina was saying. But go ahead, wish your question. Um, I was just wondering, if you already talked about it, I might have missed it, I logged in a little bit late, but um, was there a process for ensuring and verifying IRB approval before releasing patient level data? Um, yes, so when you do request patient level data, each site will go through their data request process and then you know, they'll make sure you have the proper um, IRB compliance approval, stuff like that. Um, and so all that would happen after you request more data. Okay. But um, so that happens off off the ladder website. It's happening. Off right. Off right. So once you um, once you put in your request for more data, then um, your site will reach out to you, and then help <coughs> kind of facilitate the process of obtaining data from the other site. I and see. at that point, that's all outside of the ladder application. I see. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we had a question in the chat where someone asked if you're able to select um, all the results in the find terms window and drag it to a query. Um, so you can't multi, I don't believe that you can multi-select, no. Um, so you can't multi-select these options, you would have to drag them over individually like this. And I hope that answers that question. And also feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, if you're shy. Yeah, I have another question. If we work at multiple of the sites, um, will the mm -hmm. one login work for all the sites, or how will that work? Um, so since each site has its own, um, each site will have its own letter, ladder application link, so like this is the specific UCLA one, um, then Whichever site you know gave you an account, if it's multiple, um, you would either choose one of those links to use or whichever one you want to use. Um, but typically, you need to be you know currently like currently have a position at that site. Okay, thanks. Well, actually, is, so is the site based on the email that we provided to get into this webinar? Um, yeah, so we're going to be giving the site the list of people, um, and they'll reach out to the participants uh, <coughs> based off of the email that was based off of the email that was provided when you registered. All right, got it. I would like to know if you were planning on expanding the ladder to the rest of um, California. Sorry, it was hard to hear you. I asked if you would uh, be willing or you have any plans to expand the ladder to the rest of California to so add other institutions. I could, maybe I could. Um, which that. site are you from? City of Hope. Um, what other sites would you be interested in getting counts from or data? Um, no, it's just a general question. We have talked to, uh, okay. this is Doug Bell, I'll just speak up to say that we have talked to some other institutions. Uh, um, there's nothing uh, firm at this point, but we would like to expand. Uh, we've talked to some Orange County institutions. We've talked to Providence, uh, well, we've explored the idea of Providence. We've talked to Memorial Care a little bit. Um, 
but um, there's there's nothing on the books right now in terms of expansion beyond these the, the ones that we talked about earlier. Um, but if there is something you're particularly interested in, um, let us know. There is separately okay. a UC Rex, uh, uh, which involves the five um, uh, UC organizations. Um, and then there is something called ACT, which is uh, a national network uh, that um, involves, it, ultimately, the idea is it will involve all the CTSA in the nation. Um, and, uh, you know, we could talk about how to get you guys hooked up to that, too, if, if you're interested. Thank you. Other questions? Um, hi, I had a, a question. So you had mentioned um, for to get the patient level data could take one to two months. Sure. Um, so it could take a few months. It can vary widely depending on how complicated the data request is. Um, so usually, especially if you're getting data from multiple sites, so we just recommend to put in your request as soon as you can, um, just so that we at least know about it and can get started um, with the whole consulting process. Um, so yeah, just as soon as you can, at least a few months in advance. Okay. And do you find, um, I'm not sure how often this has been done so far, but are most of the sites um, able, like, approving the request for the patient level data? Has it ever been denied, depending on what the request is? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I was typing, but I think I need to answer that one. Um, I'm just wondering, like, the approval rating. So, like, for example, if I wanted to look at um, compare survival for a specific disease outcome across all of the institutions, um, like, how likely is it that I would get approval for the patient level data, or is there the opportunity that it has been denied? Uh, I don't think that we've really come across a situation where a request has been denied. You would just need to have a collaborator at each site that you're requesting data from, so uh, especially if it's an identified data set that you're getting. Um, okay. So I think, yeah, so if anyone who's listening now on the call has a, an idea of data that they want to get and they have more questions about like what is the process for getting data from other sites and how long is it going to take, it does vary across our sites. So I, what I would do, what I recommend is that you reach out to your ladder contact, um, describe your request to them and then they can, internally we will all have a discussion. Um, and uh, figure out how to make your request work. And then we can give you uh, information that's specific to your situation. Okay. Are there any other questions? This is Doug again. I'll just say that um, we are particularly interested in supporting grant applications. Um, and so if anybody is contemplating uh, doing a grant on this, especially on this cycle, uh, you know, please let us know um, and we will um, try to expedite uh, whatever we can for you. Um, although, you know, as Marianne was saying, the earlier the better. Uh, so, um, uh, so run those queries now. Check out who you might want, uh, what, which sites might be good collaborators, and um, get us in the loop. Okay, it's going to be easier for me to answer some of these questions just by speaking out loud. So, I see someone asked, uh, which kind of data can we get from Ladder? 
Um, can you be a little bit more specific? What do you mean by kind of data? Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost any data in the medical record that you can get. Did that answer the question for that person? Um, okay, so for the next question, do you have some use cases of projects that have been published that started in Ladder? Um, not yet, but we would love for you guys to be the first ones. Uh, okay, how accurate is the data for sickle cell disease? Dr. Bell, I'm going to let you take that one. It, it should, uh, it, it's only as accurate as the clinical coding is. So um, if, uh, it, it, and it should be it, that should be pretty accurate for sickle cell disease. Um, uh, so I, I think um, for diagnosis anyway, like you can, uh, if if you're interested in like the hemoglobin electrophoresis, that's probably in there as a test, but the results are probably not quantitative. So that's what Karina was referring to about if there's a particular test that you want. Um, and if it has results that are um, that are uh, uh, qualitative results, like you know, I'm not sure what it would be exactly for hemoglobin electrophoresis, but something like you know hemoglobin F, if you want that result, uh, we'd probably have to work out um, uh, extracting that specific result and getting it uh, added to ladder. Um, uh, so that's is, does that answer your question? It should be pretty accurate, and, and we do have, um, uh, for City of Hope, I think uh, it said that we didn't have ICD-10s in yet, but we just got them in, so we, uh, the ICD-10, so diagnosis should be accurate all the way up to the last couple of months, even for City of Hope. As long as it's a you know, something was built for, as long as there's an encounter with that diagnosis, that patient should get counted. Um, but I'll just reemphasize that it's always a count of distinct patients that you get out of ladder. So, um, you know, so no matter how many times they got the diagnosis, there's only going to count as one patient. And so with that, I want to answer uh, one of the questions that came up uh, is, are you planning on iterating data from any other clinical uh, research areas like cancer registry or biobank? Uh, Karina's going to go ahead and talk about uh, two of the forms that we have. Okay, so she's going to actually pull it up on her slide and I'll talk about it, or on her screen. Um, so you see in the latter application, there's a feedback link. So if you want to request uh, other variables, you would just click on that link and let us know, um, or if there's any issues. And then also, when you're running queries in Ladder, um, there's like a one in ten chance that you're going to get a pop-up survey that asks for um, your opinion on Ladder, um, and you can report things there as well. Um, so those are the two uh, mechanisms that you can use to request additional data, or you can also reach out to your sites directly and then. We'll hear about it that way. That was excellent. And, and I, but I would just add that uh, we do happen to be working on biobank and um, cancer registry data and getting it added. It's not in there now. But um, uh, <laughs> let, let us know what your priority would be between those two. That, that would be interesting, too. I think, I think we're looking at trying to get biobank in there first. Um, but uh, but but those are both projects we're looking we're looking at. Um, and then someone also asked. Um, if a patient has records at two of the institutions in Ladder, do they appear as separate patients? Um, so we aren't able to keep track of um, within the application of patients who are part of different institutions, so you wouldn't be able to tell 
um, they would come up as a unique patient at their institution, but they may be counted again um, at their second institution. Yeah, that's right. That's a um, great question. Oh, oh, go ahead, Marianne. Oh, no, if you have, I was going to skip to the next question, so you oh, can okay. go ahead and finish it up. I was just going to say that we are working on uh, being able to link identities across institutions. Um, that's kind of a hot area right now um, nationally. Um, you know, nationally, there aren't any others that, that do the networks like this that, that are able to link patients. But uh, we're working on that. Um, we're probably still a year away. And then exactly how we're going to identify those patients in this interface is going to be another question, but, but we are working on it. Okay. Um, someone asked the question, do you mean all medical records for the specific cohort I created and which format of data can we get a table or the original records? I think this has to do with a question that we were already talking about, and I think, Dr. Bond, maybe you answered it. Yeah, perhaps, uh, you know, I think this is a question about what the data would look like when you request the individual data. And, um, <coughs> you know, that's um, each site has their own approach to this, but in, in general, you would get a set of tables. You you don't get the original medical record or some kind of, but you would get data extracted from it, which usually we provide in separate tables that reflects the cardinality and the underlying data if I'm making sense there. But uh, um, so, so in other words, you know, um, one row per patient for a patient table and then one row per encounter for an encounters table, um, one row per lab value for a labs table, that sort of thing. What is the geographic reference? Sorry, there's a geographic question. Uh, yeah, well, hold on. Um, we don't have the geo-coded data in there yet, do we? No. Um, at UCLA, we have geo-coded every patient's address as part of the, you know, back-end uh, oh, EHR data. We've kind of added a geocode. Um, so, so, and, and there are some things we can do to query that data at UCLA, but it's not, it hasn't been implemented at the other sites, so it's not available in Ladder. So that would be an example of a query uh, that would require um, the programmers to run it. So you can submit the request through um, the request more data form on the website. Um, there's a question that says, can you get information about specialty consult frequencies? That's interesting. No, I, not at the moment, but so that would be something we'd have to construct a special query for. It's definitely there in the record, but, um, uh, but yeah, that would have to be constructed. And if it's something that, you know, people are interested in, let us, just as Marianne said, fill, fill out that uh, feedback form and let us know. And we, it, it could be added, um, but it's not right now. Okay, did anyone have any other questions? Okay, so uh, again, as Karina mentioned, we are going to go ahead and post uh, the recording of this webinar on the ladder.org website. Um, and again, here's the contact information for each site. So if you have further questions later on, you can go ahead and contact your site. Um, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar, and um, we are very excited to see you running queries in our tool. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, folks.